So what I want to know is, uh, what drives you to make sculpts like this? Like, is it to stick it to GW or do you just really love <laughs> recreating Money. cool things that you're inspired by? Well, um, I thought about it. It's because uh, I just started modeling. I thought to myself, That's, this would be the perfect opportunity to make some big cash. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so apparently Games Workshop are refreshing their guardsmen with this new army box called Cadia Stands. And that's going to be up for pre-order soon with delivery from the 25th of November, it looks like. So let's have a little 3D printing race. Can I locate, print, assemble, and paint an equivalent set to GW's new box before the 25th? Cadia Stands? More like Cadia Stands, no chance. Oh, I'm going. Sorry. I, yeah, that was bad. So yeah, I think the answer to this is a pretty boring yes, if I'm being honest. So let's at least try and make it interesting. How about I use this, and this, and this. The Anycubic Photon S is a bit of a legend in the world of resin printing at this point, and a reliable workhorse capable of churning out perfectly decent miniatures for tabletop games. But it does have a major handicap for a big printing project like this. It's a really, really slow printer. So kicking this race off with a machine upgrade and a new resin to dial in should at least give GW a bit of a fighting chance. Chitu Systems very kindly sent me these products to try out. Thank you, Chitu. So let's just get started right away with the LCD upgrade and go from there. How hard could it be? So I'm gonna install that in there. And then how the fuck, so that, that's gotta go on there. No, that is bullshit. How? I have no idea how I'm gonna do that. It's never gonna. Oh, it's gonna be a miracle if this goes on. I don't get it. I don't understand how this is physically possible. Why? <laughs> oh, what? Come on. Come on. Come on. Oh my god, I think I got it. Wow. Yep, it's on there. <sighs> I fucking hated that. It's funny, you can even see them struggling with it in their installation guide video. There is clearly an art to installing that cable. Anyway, with that finally done, I can already advise you to stay the hell away from this thing if you hate tinkering. Otherwise, if you can stomach the challenge, maybe it's worth it for the faster printing time and longer LCD life. Oh, nice. Yeah, how does that smell? <sighs> Fucking hell. <laughs> This is weird. All my calibration prints look very bad. Even on the low end where I should be seeing clear indications of underexposure, I'm getting squashed and bloated details. It's almost like it's shrunk slightly in the z-axis. I tried re-leveling the bed again, double checked I had all the LCD dimensions and screen offset settings identical to Chitu's recommendations, made sure I wasn't printing too many burn-in layers, I even tried slicing in both Lychee and Chitu box, and I just kept getting the same useless results. Sorry Photon S, but you're out. We have a race to win here, and I can't afford to lose any more time troubleshooting this issue. Mono X, you're up. One plate of Amerilabs town tests later, and we have the Mono X calibrated to the Chitu Systems Conjusculpt resin. Except we don't, because I remember I got a couple of comments on the last video telling me that I should try the Cones of Calibration. So I put those results aside for the moment and promptly forgot about them while I spent an entire day printing the Cones of Calibration. Because apparently I love to waste time when racing against the clock. All right, so yeah, I didn't need to spend a whole day printing the cones. Stop that. The cones of calibration, but I was honestly not expecting to have to jump up nearly two seconds in normal exposure time to get from this result to this. Also, if you're wondering, my lift speed was a snail's pace, 40 millimeters a minute. So that's definitely not the reason. Oh, and before you go copying that 3.9 second time for your own profile, I wouldn't, but we'll come back to that later. So with the cones having given me my answer, it was now finally time to begin sourcing and printing minis. 
Guard is a fun one for 3D printing because there's a lot of options presently. We've got everything from shovel wielding trench warfare maniacs to high tech tactical shock troops. There's even regal as fuck knights with laser guns and power swords and shit if you want. For me the choice was simple. When I first laid eyes on these lovely paint jobs from Cole Festus over on Instagram, I was sold. Just look at these man. The dude is a legendary painter so go give him a follow. The minis themselves come from the Maker's Cult. These dudes are a giant in the 3D printed minis scene, so it was no surprise to me to see their name tied to these badass sculpts. What we're looking at here is the Universal Guard and Sergeant Builders, which I'll have links to below in the video description. I spent some time looking at exactly what comes in GW's new box to make sure I was recreating something as close as possible in terms of loadouts and that sort of thing. The GW Command Squad has a dude with a flag, so I'll have to keep that in mind. There's also this guy with this big honking comms unit. Maybe this dude screaming into a radio will have to do for that. Otherwise, everything else here like the power fist and the sword guys, I'm pretty sure we can approximate with the universal guard builder already. But let's come back to that shortly and see if we can't find some of the other models in the box. I must have tried 20 different search terms and scoured hundreds of results looking through models until finally I found something. And here's where we wander into somewhat of a gray area. Uh, okay, uh, the first question. How do I pronounce? Uh, is it Weissnicks? It's a bit difficult uh, in English. In German, you spell it uh, Weissnicks. Like Weissnicks. Yeah, that, that's, that's good. So Weissnicks was nice enough to jump on a chat and let me pick his brain about modeling. I wanted to gain a little more insight into the Warhammer STL underground. So how close would you say your sculpts are to the GW sculpts? Scaling-wise or... Or detail wise just generally like detail scaling like are you trying to mm. make them like obviously i guess you don't want to make them identical and i have noticed yours are like there's differences um so they're not like 100 percent. not by accident uh no nah, sorry uh not with intention for example do you have your have your ordnance batteries if you remember there was uh when they were shown there was only there was only one picture of them right yeah this is all you had to work off. That's, that's all I've been working with. I had to come up with something because I only had this one picture and pretty much only one side of the model was shown. Not, not even. It was pretty much only the front. Yeah, so you would say yours is pretty different than to GW's model. It's just heavily inspired. <laughs> it's inspired. By... Yeah. You wouldn't notice from the front. But yeah, the rest is uh, my own stuff. Cool. So what I want to know is... Uh, what drives you to make sculpts like this? Like, is it to stick it to GW, or do you just really love <laughs> recreating Money. cool things that you're inspired by? Well, um, I thought about it. It's because uh, I just started modeling. I thought to myself, that's this would be the perfect opportunity to make some big cash. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> And he was even nice enough to recommend me other suitable proxies for this project, including the new Imperial Armored Sentinel. Yeah, okay. I better message this dude too. Hello. How's it going? Doing well. You? That's good. Yeah, not too bad. Is it uh, Guillaume? Am I pronouncing that yeah. right? Yeah, Guillaume. Guillaume. However you want to pronounce it, really. One of the things I wanted to ask you is like, how different do you think your model is to the, the official one? I think it's pretty close. The one big thing that's going to be different is the back, because there were absolutely no screenshots of that in in the previous Games Workshop did. Yeah, and you did that from how, how many reference photos? Oh, not a lot. <laughs> I wish there were more. <laughs> so what would you say your primary motivation is when you sit down to recreate a model like this and, and release it for free? Is it to like stick it to GW, or is it just more for the the love of the sculpt and, and wanting to just recreate it yourself and put it out there. To be honest, I really love 3D. I do that all the time, like making models and seeing this model in the previews, I, I wanted to try and make my own version of it. And because I even when I'm at home in my free time, I keep making 3D projects. But there was a little bit of a feeling to stick it a bit to GW because <laughs> <laughs> 
let's be honest, the model is so cheap on tabletop and it's so expensive in, <laughs> in the figurine. <laughs> it's like, how much was it? I think like 50 points and 50 euros to buy. Like, come on. Oh, that's insane. A euro per point. That's probably like $2 Australian. <laughs> so it's a little bit of that you would say, but then also it's you're inspired by it and, and you know, you love working in yeah, 3D. Uh, it sounds like. Yeah, because I always want to make extra projects, stuff for either my portfolio or personal work. And th this is the kind of things I like to do, hard surface, mechs, and all that stuff. So it's, it was a cool exercise to do. So I think it's really interesting that neither of these guys' minis are identical to the GW minis that they're attempting to copy. Whether for preference or just limitations in the source material, their stuff is arguably original in its own way. Is this wrong or right? I don't know. For me, I think where it gets a little more grey is charging money for designs like these. Are there concerns around like charging money for something when it's uh, like... Essentially a copy? Es essentially, yeah. I was, was going to pull a number out of my ass, like more than 90% derivative or something like that, but, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> to some degree, maybe, but it's not a huge thing I, I, um, I'm thinking about. Yeah, because I, I guess... That, that's um, a market the people want it, and I want money. Yeah. But at the same time, there's also no one else doing it. So it's like the perfect mm -hmm. opportunity. And I have, at the moment, a good amount of skills to accomplish these scopes, scopes. So is that important to you when you create a model like this that is basically... Uh, you're doing the you're doing everything you can to make it as similar or as close to something else. Is it important to you that it is free for the community when you release it? That you don't try and monetize it? Yeah, for a model like this, because uh, I I pretty much just copied uh, this model from another work. You know, like the Games Workshop official Sentinel, but uh, so to me, if I charged money for it, it would be really like for the copyright and everything, that wouldn't be right. Because it's, it's not really my own design. 3D modeling is not an easily learned skill, and it takes a hell of a lot of time and effort to create 3D models, not to mention make them printable as well. So I can understand the desire to be compensated for all that hard work, but I can also appreciate how trying to copy another artist's designs as closely as possible would be considered piracy. Or is it more like Coke versus Pepsi? They're both trying to make cola, and that's all above board. Or is it no different than fan art? I'm sure there's a wide range of opinions here, so I'd love to hear yours. Do you think 3D printing is a threat to GW? Is this practice of copying their designs hurting them, whether made free or otherwise? Or is it completely inconsequential? Whatever your stance on it, I think we can all agree that this technology is here, sculpts like this will keep being made, and people will continue to download and print them. One of the coolest things about 3D printing though, and I'll keep saying this as long as the channel is around, is being able to find awesome alternative sculpts to proxy in for Warhammer minis. Like these Universal Guard from the Maker's Cult. They haven't tried to copy GW's Guard one for one, they've given us something fresh and unique, and that is the really exciting thing about 3D printing for our tabletop games. All the variety it opens up to us. If you did consider it piracy though, you might want to think about using a VPN so GW can't track you while you pirate their minis. That's why today's sponsor... Just kidding, I don't have a sponsor. But imagine if I did, would that not have been the most perfect segue? Both Vicenix and Guillaume were happy for me to feature their models and have a chat for this video, but only Vicenix was okay with a link to his models to go in the video description. But honestly, it's pretty easy to find the Sentinel model. It won't take you long. While Vicenix had provided his weapons batteries pre-supported, Guillaume's walker was going to take some elbow grease to get printed. So I fired up Lychee and got to work. For a free model though, you can't really complain about it coming unsupported, but I'll send these supported files over to Guillaume when I'm done here so he can add them to the download and you can print this walker off without having to put in all that effort too. Oh, but don't print the included base though, it's the wrong size. You'll need an 80mm base for this one. I forgot to mention before, but after calibrating this conjure sculpt resin with the cones of calibration, I first ran off a plate of known good files that featured in my last video, the Solar Guard from Red Makers. I just wanted to have something familiar to compare this new resin against. Support removal seemed a bit tougher, though only marginally. However, no matter how vigorously I swished these minis around in alcohol, I found them to be pretty difficult to get clean. The Conjure resin is more viscous than other resins, so maybe that's why, but this is going to be a problem. 
Oh, hello. Yes, I would like a wash and cure machine. Thank you, Elegoo. I think after seeing how much I suffered while washing the Into the Dark box set on the channel, Elegoo took mercy on me because they've sent over this cute little wash and cure station. I've been wanting to get my hands on a machine like this for the longest time to see if it'll make my life easier, so I'll let you know how this goes. Feisnix also had some Cadian flags available on his cult page, so I figured I'd try my hand at kitbashing one of them with the Maker's Cult bits. This was definitely a more advanced digital kitbash, as Blender isn't exactly the most beginner-friendly piece of software, but if you're curious about exactly how I did this, I'll leave a link to a guide in the video description. This turned out pretty cool, I think, though I might have shrunk the flag a bit too much, but whatever, I'm happy with it. Thanks to the Mono X's large build volume and Mono LCD, I was able to print just about everything off in pretty short order. The first thing I wanted to test with the wash and cure machine was to see if I could jam as many models into a wash cycle as possible and still get clean parts. to say it did a great job with the parts feeling squeaky clean and actually looking dry after drying. Is that normal? I don't think that's normal. This is so stupid. Oh no. That is true IP67 water rating. <laughs> IP whatever the fuck it is. Oh man. Where are you? I can't feel anything. Oh, you know what it is? It must be sticking through the- yeah it is, it's one of these guys. Sticking through the bottom. So I do all that for nothing. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So yeah, that was really dumb. I think I have a solution to this problem. I had some metal fly screen mesh laying around, so I cut and folded a section of that to line the wash tray. I thought maybe the reason they didn't have a finer mesh on the tray would be to impede the flow of the alcohol less, but turns out it still washes just fine even with this mesh in there so now I can throw tiny bits in with no worries. I am concerned about the longevity of this particular wire mesh though, like will the alcohol corrode or degrade it in some way? One of my channel members, Peaky, suggested stainless steel fly screen mesh, and yeah, I think that sounds like a good idea, so I'll have to pick some up. Cheers, Peaky. With the easiest print washing of my life now done, I moved on to support removal and assembly, and here's where I noticed something pretty interesting. The details on the minis looked a little softer than I expected, and support removal was definitely on the tougher side, with support tips remaining behind, and in some places the sides of the supports had completely bonded to the models. Now that can be a case of the supports being placed too close in the slicer, but I had a pretty good idea what I was looking at here were overexposed prints. I remembered I had a bunch of Amerilabs Town calibration prints laying around for the Mono X and Conjure Sculpt, and fuck. According to this, the ideal exposure time lays somewhere between 1.8 and 2.2 seconds. So what the hell is going on here? Did I fuck up cones of calibration? Are the cones biased toward an overexposed result? Did you do me dirty cones? I needed answers. I figured I could spend a bunch more time printing cones and testing theories, or I could go straight to the source. Hey, how's it going? Hey, Ty. I am very well, thanks. How are you? I'm doing all right. So Ty from Table Flip Foundry and creator behind the Cones of Calibration was extremely generous with his time and sat down with me to discuss my experience and speculate as to what went wrong. And I found this to be an incredibly insightful chat. There are so many variables to 3D printing and all we're talking about is exposure. But if you have, you know, a stretched FEP or FEP that's too thin or FEP that you've cleaned six times with the paper towel and now it's all scratched and cloudy and has more adhesion to your resin or your lift speeds are really high or your z screw is bent or you know you didn't mix your resin you left it two days in a row and didn't mix it when you printed or you know like there's so many variables that um everybody wants the one sentence answer when it when they're having problems and and then when you know they, it doesn't matter whether it's my my calibration part is more likely to fail as a result of 
other mechanical variables, whereas like even the cities, a bear lab town or whatever, is less likely to fail as a result of mechanical difficulties. If you if you have minor FEP where you're probably not even going to know of it, whereas the the cones can magnify that and make it more apparent. In your situation, there's a like I always try to look at it like I don't have the answer. I can't give you the one answer or the one sentence answer because there are many things it could be, and so then it just becomes tracking it down. So it would be if you, let's say, for example, had a um, a small portion of your FEP that was holding on stronger than, let's say, other areas of the FEP around it. And that could be a little little dimple that creates um, some mechanical um, retention on the resin. It could be a little scratch. It could be it could be various things on the FEP, and it doesn't have to be much. It just has to be there. In the location where the success, what we're calling the index cone, the one cone we care the most about, is having a harder time being peeled off the FEP. What can happen there is you can get like a, you can get an abnormal reading. So the most reasonable speculation as to why my cones didn't succeed until 3.9 seconds, I think would be that that particular spot on the FEP was just a little too sticky. But speculating is all I have time for at the moment. The real takeaway from this conversation though for me was tensile strength versus dimensional accuracy. So I guess what I wanted to know is, I mean, I, I, I think I, I've done cones of calibration correct, but is, is it a case of the cones are biased toward a, an overexposure result? It's, it is not. So this is, so, so this is sort of like, a, this would be a long, a long talk. I don't know how much of it you'll be able to use, but um, when I first started this, the idea um, it just came from being a you know professional pre supportist So mm -hmm. um, I realized that calibration, I kept seeing people, which I said in the video, just like confused about calibration. And so I tried to break it down to like, like the roots of 3D printing. Like I think we're overcomplicating these things by adding little notches and little, little, you know, like a little poles that are sticking up at 45 degrees and we're supposed to figure <laughs> out like how many of them are supposed to stand up and but they're like, they're just convoluted in my opinion. Not that they're bad, it's just you have to have sort of like a, a bigger a knowledge base. But also I noticed that our in our community didn't have a standard. Like we don't have a metric where we all can say, we like, like while we don't have the same settings, our results are the same, so to speak. Yeah. And so like the idea behind it was, well, everything has to be supported anyway. So let's use that as a foundation for printability. So here's the, here's like the, I'll, I, I tend to say a lot of words to say a few words. And so I'll, I'm going to go around the block, but it'll, it should hopefully make a lot of sense. That's, by the time that's I get totally there. fine. I do the same thing. <laughs> so, um, so there are two different types of calibrations, at least there are now. Right. Mm -hmm. And the first type, which is what you might see which is uh you know soraya tech has one any cubic has one um the, the little plates or whatever uh amerilab city was or the town was like my go-to before this and so that those tests generally speaking are what we would call dimensional accuracy tests so if i were to ask you like with any knowledge whatever level of knowledge you've you know you've got channels uh, a whole channel on 3D printing and hobbying. So your knowledge is probably more advanced than a lot of people. It's like, if I were to ask you, what is the perfect exposure? Like, how would you describe that? So most people would say, you know, like the idea is that the print comes out the same, the exact same as what you put in. So you put it in the slicer, you slice it, you put it on a card, you put it in the printer, it comes out. What you should get is ident like identical, not similar but identical, right? That would be the perfect exposure. So, you know, the term we, we use often is dimensional accuracy. If I have a cube that's 10 millimeters by 10 millimeters by 10 millimeters, and I print it and it comes out 10.1, well, I'm overexposing. I print it, it comes out 9.9, .9, and I'm underexposing, right? So the goal is what you put in is exactly what you get back out. Now, this is totally achievable with any resin at any time for any reason, right? And these calibration tests that have all these different indicators are still unnecessary, right? All you need is a set of calipers and a cube to, to calibrate your printer. That's literally it, right? And so it's still an overcomplicated thing to a bunch of people who are trying to learn a very technical skill. 
but that would be like the the most of the community's explanation or understanding of what exposure means the thing is is that not all resins are made the same and so i'm going to use some extreme examples here z mud is is like notoriously one of the lowest quality resins you can buy it's the cheapest resin on the market um as very and, and and this is the part that most of the community probably would hear and be like oh of course but generally doesn't actually think about right which is that all resins are not made the same right they don't have the same properties they don't have the same variables so so you get z mud and z mud can be printed at dim dimensional accuracy it is possible um, but it has very low tensile strength and so when you start to to build supports on it and then you're you're trying to peel it up off the FEP using torque, you can kind of rip apart that resin really easily. Well, what does that mean? That means that pre-supports don't work for Z-Mud, not easily at least. And so we can print like the Amerilabs Town or any of these other tests and we can get perfect dimensional accuracy, especially with the low quality resin like Z-Mud. But then we go to print a pre-supported model and everything fails. And, and a lot of people, especially newer people, aren't understanding why it's failing. So let's say you compare that to Amerilabs, I think it's um, TGM8 or something like that. I, I'm butchering that, but they have a very high quality miniature resin. Um, so you go and you do your dimensional accuracy calibration and then you go to print miniatures and everything prints. So you've done the exact same process with two different resins but the results were completely different. And so a lot of people will attribute that to something they're doing wrong. And what they don't realize is what they're doing wrong is expecting high quality out of low quality. And so um, I'm unfamiliar with the resin you're using, but this is kind of what I suspect would, would be taking place is that the cones doesn't account at all for dimensional accuracy. If you happen to get dimensional accuracy by using the cones, it is by coincidence. What the cones do specifically is tune you to a point where your settings will work with most pre-supported models. And the results that come after that are a direct result of the quality of your resin. So if you use the you know, Z-MUD, you can run the cones and you'll have to do what, what you're experiencing, which is turn your exposure way up. Well, when the exposure is way up, we're, we're dimensionally larger than we should be. And the larger the, the mass of, of the support, the stronger the support. And so all of a sudden, after the cones of calibration, you can actually print pre-supported models with ZMUD. But then you get the, the models, you get the supports off the models, and you look at the models, and they're completely blown out. They're, they're totally overexposed. But... You can you can have a resin, and even if it's high quality resin, it could be a low a low tensile strength resin. We'll take like nobody prints in tenacious by itself for the most part, but tenacious the flex resin is a very low tensile strength resin. It'll stretch, but it'll break relatively easily when being pulled on. And so, if you were to try to print a mini um, with the cones of calibration, you could, but it'd be overexposed. And if you try to print it dimensionally accurate it would like the supports wouldn't work so there is this balance we all are sort of like struggling to find when it comes to um, calibrating our printers because our understanding of what is perfect is, is sort of like loose to everybody like most people if i asked 10 people you know nine of them may have a hard time responding with something um, and the 10th person would be like dimensional accuracy and and then even still that's a very difficult response because um you know if dimensional accuracy is perfect exposure but nothing prints is it really perfect exposure since launching the mini rater project and thank you everyone by the way who has contributed ratings already on there it's so awesome seeing it come to life but yeah since launching that I've had at least one or two people point out that it's technically a futile endeavor because there's no way in the world you can pre-support a mini to work across every type of resin. And after my chat with Ty, I'm starting to see the logic in that. I've always kind of assumed that generally speaking, if you're printing minis for tabletop games, your resin of choice shouldn't be a problem for pre-supported minis, assuming you've calibrated it and that the minis were supported well. And I think the way I've come to that conclusion is I'm always printing with the cheapest, nastiest stuff available. 
So it's been my personal belief that you can pre-support a Mini to work across all the common resins people are printing with, specifically for tabletop miniatures, but personal beliefs aren't worth shit. We need hard data. Data? Data. It's one of those. If Ty is correct and we all agree to sacrifice dimensional accuracy and calibrate to tensile strength instead, then this effectively gives us a standard by which the type of resin you end up using doesn't even matter. Because if a miniature has been pre-supported and passed test printing on a resin calibrated to tensile strength, then no matter what resin it is you like to use, if you've calibrated to tensile strength too, then you should have a successful print also in theory. So you can expect to see a deep dive on this very topic next year on this channel. I'm going to get my hands on as many different kinds of resins as I can, calibrate for both dimensional accuracy and tensile strength, do test prints at both, and share my findings with you guys. I suspect that a list of resins will rise to the top as the best for tabletop miniatures that, when calibrated for tensile strength, also happen to fall pretty damn close, if not exactly on dimensional accuracy too. It could even be the case that every single resin when calibrated to dimensional accuracy still prints the test models fine, in which case I'll continue to recommend Amerilabs Town. If you're a manufacturer of resin and you want to help with this, please get in touch. I need all the resins. Anyway, that's enough about that topic for now. Back to Kadia. Standing. A chance. Not really. While I was having a chat with Ty, I had the Mars 3 Pro printing the rest of the Guardsmen that I needed to complete the set. That machine is still calibrated to dimensional accuracy using any cubic standard grey from the last video. I'm glad I did this because now I can show you the difference this made in support removal as well as confidently provide a rating for the Maker's Cult in this video. Check that out. No support tips left behind, no bonding on the models, easy removal, no failures, just perfect. The Maker's Cult did a great job but there was just a handful of minor things I found that they could tighten up. They didn't provide the slicer files, their pre-supported files mostly contained minor errors, why does no one catch these? And there was a handful of unsupported islands. All minor stuff, so the Maker's Cult for now have earned themselves an A tier rating, so good job TMC. All that was left to do was assemble everything together and get it painted up. Assembly was really easy. One of my favorite things about the way the Maker's Cult designed these parts is the two-handed weapons print as a singular piece, so it's super quick and easy to get them glued onto the torsos. Guillaume's walker went together really nicely too, and Vicenix's weapons platforms were pretty straightforward, though I did accidentally break these strut thingies and had to use tweezers to place them properly. Oh, and in my mad dash to get this done as quickly as possible, I forgot to install the wheels on the rocket launcher. Uh, <laughs> I had to mangle the front foot of the thing to get those installed, but hopefully that'll get covered up later on when basing. I did my best as well to make the Universal Guardsmen look like they're actually operating the equipment. I decided to treat myself to a new hobby tool here, Steinal Res Primer. And I'm really glad I did, because this stuff was so nice to use. No thinning required, it has a nice matte finish, and yeah, the airbrush gave me no complaints while using this primer. More expensive than the Vallejo stuff, but worth it I think if it makes airbrushing easier. Next up I dry brushed everything pretty heavily in Vallejo cold white, and then spent the next 5 hours or so base coating all these minis using Army Painter speed paints. This was painful. I used varying ratios of Crusader skin and dark wood to create a variety of skin tones for my Cadians, applying this to their faces wherever visible. I actually had a bit of a hard time telling which ones did have bare faces, because a lot of them seemed to have balaclavas or cloth wrapped around them, and I think the overexposed details made this a bit tricky to tell. Thankfully though, they were all wearing their uniforms properly, so I didn't have to paint any Rambo arms and chests or whatever, so this step didn't take that long. 
Next I applied pallid bone to all their uniforms including any belts and straps they had wrapped around them. I figure it's okay to skip over little details like that when painting an army because at the end they're still going to look okay when they're all together on a table. I then used camo cloak on all their helmets, armor, shoulder, knee and elbow pads. I also picked out a bunch of armor panels and details on the sentinel and weapons batteries using this color too. I personally don't mind the effect that speed paints have over broad surfaces like these, especially after the next few steps. After that their backpacks, gloves and boots all got a coat of hardened leather. This was another step where I skipped over details, just filling in all the grenades and knives and whatever else they had hanging off their packs. And you know, I could always come back later on and take this up another level if I wanted to, though I never will, let's be honest. Finally, everything that was left over got a thorough coat of Gravelord Grey, except for this guy's exceptional do. And with that, I went to bed. Oh, uh, not before painting these ammo crates in a coat of dark wood. Utterly dissatisfied with my paint job so far, I decided I'd try taking them up a notch with some edge highlighting. I first tried mixing medium blue and flat yellow together to get a bright green, but I found this to be a little too close to the green already on the minis, so to increase the brightness even more I added some lemon yellow. I tried not to spend too long on this step, just hitting any of the edges that were easy to get to on the sentinel and weapons batteries, and for the Cadians this wasn't so much edge highlighting as it was just hitting the high spots like the tops of their helmets and shoulder pads. Got another new hobby tool here to try out. This is base ready from Geek Gaming Scenics. Arid Grasslands specifically. Before applying this though, I painted all the rims of these bases in black and covered the tops in hardened leather. My thinking here was that if I don't get perfect coverage with the base ready mix, that it'll be an earthy brown color that peeks through. And also I wouldn't have to worry about getting any on the boots since those are the same color. So I could just rush through this step, not having to be too tidy. For the base ready, all I did was coat each base generously with PVA glue before burying each one in the mix. Just like the Steinal Res Primer, I think this stuff is absolutely worth it. I'm all about things that give us great results with the minimal amount of effort required, and this definitely ticks that box. I barely use that much either, so it goes a lot further than I thought it would, which is awesome, so I, I didn't even need to buy two packets. Good job, Luke. Definitely gonna pick up more of this range for future projects. Ah, oh, yes, look at that. That's awesome. Fuck yeah, dude. How do you guys? At this point, I'm pretty happy with how these guys are looking, but I still felt like they could be even better. And frankly, at this point, I think the race is won. <laughs> so might as well go the extra mile with the paint job. I decided for the final touches, I'd start by base coating all of the lenses, displays, and goggles in white before adding some speed paints to bring them to life. Interestingly, I noticed no reactivation here from the camo cloak speed paint. I mean, I don't particularly think that the reactivation thing is an issue, more just a property of the paint that you could use to your advantage if you wanted. But yeah, in this instance it was fine. I actually did notice reactivation though when applying the PVA to the bases, but no matter. I gave all the goggles on the guardsmen a drop or two of zealot yellow, and this instantly made them so much better, I reckon. That third color, it's what they were missing. I also put this color down over any lenses, as well as the little lamp thingy on the sentinel. This model as well got magic blue for its window, and the little screens on the weapons batteries got slaughter red. Finally, a dry brushing on all the metal bits using Vallejo metal colored gunmetal, and my 3D printed Kadia Stands proxy army set is complete. I'll get it all set up here on a table in a moment for you, as well as show you some absolutely insane properties of this Conjusculpt resin. But I'd just quickly like to take a second here to thank all of the latest channel members who are funding my coffee addiction. Massive thanks to Eric Pearson, Old Cheese Wiz, Marchin Shows, Fendercaster, Jim Havoc, Heretic Support, Nate's Miniatures, Nuri Kadem, Trevor C, Smythe, MCXL, Joel Gunn, Felix Grenard, Addison, and of course, Peaky. If you want to become a channel member too and get access to the Discord server, terrain STLs, and over two hours of bonus content, then check out the link in the video description. We have a great time over there, don't we guys? I said we have a great time over there, don't we guys? Conjure sculpt, ladies and gentlemen. Affiliate link down below.
yes, this Contra Sculpt resin is amazing. I'm just gonna let it speak for itself here. So I was showing a friend the amazing uh, properties of Conja Sculpt, and I think I got a little too enthusiastic about it. So it has its limits, but it's yeah, it's still pretty good. Also, Chitu have given us a discount code here, so if you do want to pick some up, you can get 15% off on Amazon. If you can find it, it's definitely worth picking up for those more delicate minis, but it's got a pretty powerful odor to it. I had to run my fume extractor the whole time this thing was printing, otherwise it stank out the house. And what about that overexposed result I ended up with? Is it a low strength resin that's always going to be blown out when calibrated to tensile strength? So I did a little more experimentation here, and after printing cones of calibration V2, which is available through the Table Flip Foundry Discord server, I landed on a completely different value of 2.9 seconds normal layer exposure time. A whole second quicker than what cones V1 gave me. I even tried printing another V1 cones at the new time of 2.9 seconds, and it was a failure. So, don't know what that's all about yet, but I went and printed another Sentinel with the new settings and it turned out great. Though it's definitely still a slightly longer exposure time than I'd have calibrated this resin to based off Amerilab's town. So yeah, unfortunately, this is a bit of an inconclusive point at the moment, but I really like this resin and I'm happy with the prints. Oh yeah, but it is a bugger to hand wash. You'll definitely want a wash and cure station for it. Speaking of washing stations, the Elegoo Mercury Plus 2 wash and cure machine that they've sent me is absolutely fantastic for washing minis, but in my opinion, it sucks at curing them, and I'll explain why. The turntable is absolutely tiny, so you're not going to fit much on there, and there's no strip of LEDs firing up through the turntable from the bottom, so once you've run a cure cycle, you're going to have to take off the lid, flip your parts, drop the lid back on, and run another cure cycle. Not to mention you have to basically convert the machine each time after washing. I still found it infinitely more convenient to just throw all my washed prints into a big tinfoil lined box, drop a UV light on top, and shake everything around every 30 seconds or so. I wish the washing basket tray thingo had a much finer mesh like the fly screen stuff I added, and I also wish that when you first turned it on that it would start in wash mode. A minor thing, but it seems to me more likely that each time you go to use this you're going to be washing prints first, right? So why does it start in cure mode? But yeah, for washing, I absolutely love it, and it's definitely made life a million times easier. So cheers again, Elegoo, for sending it over, and I definitely recommend it if your intended use case is just to wash prints. For now though, the ghetto lamp foil box combo is undefeated in my hobby arena. But what about the Photon S upgrade kit? What solution were Chitu Systems able to provide? Unfortunately, nothing concrete yet. They advised me the settings looked fine, but to try playing around with the UV intensity setting, and to maybe try slicing in Chitu box, which I'd already done, so... Based on the awful time I had installing this thing, and the useless results I got trying to calibrate it, I would say consider this upgrade with caution. Also, something worth knowing is Chitu systems are actually working on a 4K version of this kit right now, with what they tell me will be an improved LCD cable installation. So I would actually just suggest skipping this 2K mono upgrade if you have a Photon S and wait for the 4K one. Hopefully Chitu will be willing to send me one of those to try as well and I can revisit this 2K one, figure out what's gone wrong and give a good comparison for the two. All right, thanks for watching. See you next month. It's gonna be